What do we know about sequoia trees? They're old. Yeah. Anybody know how, how old the oldest sequoia tree is? <clears throat> Anybody care to take a venture? Three to four hundred years. Three or four hundred years? Anybody got another idea? Three or four hundred years? That's pretty old, right? Over a thousand, Over a thousand yeah. Yeah. In fact, sequoia trees are the tallest, the largest, and the longest living organisms on earth. One of the sequoia trees I'm going to show you today, the General Sherman, is 2,300 years old. So your 300 was, you know, close, but add a two to the front of it and you're, you're there, man. 2,300 years old. They actually found one the other day that's 2,800 years old, if you can imagine that. These things live for a long time and they grow very large. And you know what? They keep growing. How many of you heard the thing about, oh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Sequoia trees never learn that because no matter how large they get, in fact, the older and the largest the sequoia trees are the ones that are growing the fastest. The General Sherman, the one that I'm going to show you today that's 2,300 years old, it still puts out enough new wood every year, enough new wood every year to build a five to six bedroom house. That's how fast the General Sherman is growing, 2,300 years old. And they do this because they have a symbiotic root system. You know, we have a tendency to think in terms of big trees have deep roots, right? And, and anybody heard the term taproot? <laughs> you know, they have a deep taproot. Well, sequoias aren't buying any of that. The sequoias have this symbiotic root system that runs parallel to the ground only about three to four feet below the surface. And so literally what you have when you have a grove of sequoia trees, and sequoia trees don't grow alone. Sequoia trees are actually part of, of a grove. And what you have are literally a grove of trees whose roots intertwine in such a way that it's mutually beneficial to every single tree in the grove. Interesting concept. Not just thinking of oneself. Someone mentioned to me a little earlier about a, a, a candidate who was thinking of himself versus his employer, right? Sequoia trees think of one another. And in fact, they share resources between the various trees so that as they're sharing these resources, they're never competing with one another uh, for the resources. And their root structures are intertwined in such a way so that they cannot be blown down. Anybody ever heard of a sequoia tree being blown over? Rarely happens. In fact, they support each other at all times. And sequoia trees, because their root structure is interlocked and symbiotic in nature and passing these resources back and forth from one tree to the next, they are the only trees that are both drought resistant, disease resistant, fire resistant, insect resistant. And so they have this set of qualities that allow them to last and to endure for a long, long time. Here's the General Sherman. It was the largest sequoia they knew about until about a year ago. And now they found another one, which they call the president. But General Sherman is uh, the uh, 2300 year old sequoia. And guess what? They are extremely fruitful. Sequoia trees put out thousands of cones per year. And what do you think each of those cones becomes? Maybe not every one of them, but many of them become yet another tree, right? And so as we're thinking about sequoia trees, <laughs> I'm brought back to this Chinese proverb about the best time to plant a tree it was 20 years ago, second best time being today, right? Some of you may have heard that. <clears throat> what does all of this say about leadership? Sequoia trees, leadership. Yeah, it's about sharing the resources across the team, right? So that all the resources don't get absorbed in one spot by one tree. 
How many times have you seen an organization where too few people were, were feeding off of too many org of, the, of the, uh, the company's resources? You ever seen that? Sets in place a very, a very hazardous thing for the company, right? When you have too few resources scattered among even fewer people inside the organization. What else does this say about leadership? This whole topic of the sequoia trees. Yeah, yeah. How many organizations have you seen where people are shooting at each other? <laughs> I mean, you know, setting fires for one another. You know, let's see you jump this hurdle. How many, how many companies have you seen working that way, right? And we wonder why companies fail. We wonder why leaders fail. We wonder why people fail. We wonder why our society is in such a dearth of leadership. But the sequoia trees tell us that we should be sharing some of those resources. I'm not preaching communism, please understand. But I'm talking about inside of an organization, making sure that you're feeding those young and aspiring leaders who are part of the team versus management saying we have our privilege, right? What else does the sequoia tree analogy tell us about leadership? Never too late to start. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, to that point, if your employees simply think they're just employees right now, you can go back today and say, you know what? You're a leader. Believe it or not, and I may never have told you this before, but you are a leader. And I understand that you make widgets and, and you never really aspired to be in management. It doesn't matter. The way you approach your job matters a lot to everyone around you. Never too late to start. One last uh, idea that comes from the sequoia trees. Anybody got one? Yeah. Stand the test of time. Yeah. Yeah. Everything has a life cycle, right? But what these trees have taught us is that life cycle could have been a lot longer than anticipated. Most trees don't last anywhere near 2,300 years or 2,800 years or anything like that. And there's a reason why. And I'll sum it up in a word, it's apathy. <laughs> apathy. There was a study that was done, and the White House actually conducted this study of why customers leave a long-term provider of services. Why customers lead a, leave a long-term provider of services. And when they did this study, they were expecting to find out, well, to find responses like, well, you know, that long-term provider of services just wasn't competitive over time. They just didn't keep, they didn't have the right kinds of products. They didn't keep abreast of the changes in the market. They, they, felt, they expected to find, well, you know, price was a big driver. You know, as foreign competition came into the marketplace, certainly they weren't, they weren't competitive. They expected to hear that companies had become more mobile and so they were no longer in a particular geographic area buying from that one supplier, but now they were buying from multiple suppliers. They expected a lot of different things. But you know what it came down to? And these are some of those things that they sort of expected to find. What it came down to was two out of three people said that the reason they left a supplier that, or a, a provider of services or a vendor or a partner the reason they left and stopped doing business with that company was because of the attitude of indifference by one employee. Just one. What does that mean? Yeah. At that moment in time, in that customer's mind, that one employee was a representation of the entire company. What else does that mean? Every employee matters. Every employee matters. And so when we talk to every employee about their actions being an act of leadership, it really, really matters. Because when that phone call comes in and it comes to the first person who takes the call, let's say it's a receptionist, who is the leader of the company at that moment? 
Yeah. yeah. And, and by the way, how many of you work with companies where the sales cycle to get a new customer is longer than a month? Yeah. How many of you work in organizations where it takes you longer than six months to get a new customer? Yeah. Anybody work in an organization where it takes you years to get a new customer? Yeah. Some companies spend years and it's just their sales cycle, right? It takes, maybe there's a lot of technology involved. Maybe there, you know, uh, there are things they have to convince the potential customer of over a longer period of time to show they can be trusted. One employee, one employee, <coughs> an attitude of indifference can undo the hard work over a month, over six months, over a year, over three years, whatever that average sales cycle is, can be undone by the indifference of one employee. Is there anybody here that's a little bit surprised by that? A little bit disheartened, perhaps. <laughs> you know, when we're hiring those employees who we know are really, you know, they're not that good, they're not that bad, but they're not, they're, they're not really that good. What do we stand to expose our customers to? Kim, what do we stand to expose? Uh, what do we expose our customers to? Mediocrity. Mediocrity. And mediocrity, apathy, indifference, kills. It kills. Comments, thoughts. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the things, the uh, word indifference, I mean, typically I would have thought the employees a little bit more hostility or being unpolite or impolite or whatever, but indifference is a much more neutral term. Yeah. And, and that's, what makes it, that's what makes it so stunning, right? Yeah. That that employee that shows up who just doesn't seem to be interested can cost you the customer. Don't have to be rude. Don't have to, you know, act out on the customer premises. <laughs> Am I, believe it or not, in some workplaces that happens too, but it doesn't even take that. Just this attitude of indifference. 